Now, we turn our attention to John Teagan. He was a member of the Benghazi Security Annex team. And John, thank you so much for being with us here on America's Forum today. Yeah, thanks for having me on. Well, yesterday we heard calls from, from both sides of the aisle. We heard it both from Chairman Trey Gowdy, a Republican, and the ranking member of the Benghazi Committee, Elijah Cummings, who rise above some of the partisan bickering we've seen uh, as investigators and members of Congress try to get to the bottom of what happened. Do you think that is really going to be possible, considering how politically charged uh, this has become? I think it is possible, just as long as everybody's truthful and honest. Now, you've also probably heard these reports um, that have come from Cheryl Atkins, the, Atkinson, the former CBS reporter, uh, referencing Robert Maxwell, a high-ranking State Department official who has accused members of Hillary Clinton's uh, staff when she was Secretary of State, trying to expunge some of the record here to make her look in a more, make her look better in all this. What is your response to those reports? I... Uh, if it's true, I mean, it's going to be pretty damaging to her, but I mean, for people to actually go through and try to scrub documents like that, it's pretty shameful. Now, what we're going to hear, we've heard from a number of people, we heard from some of them yesterday, the folks who are in charge of uh, putting these new changes into place that are supposed to make other diplomatic missions, embassies and the like more safe around the world here, but we're going to hear from a number of other officials. Who do you most want to hear from testifying under oath before the Select Committee on Benghazi? I'd like to hear what Hillary has to say. I mean, honestly, just if, you know, hopefully she can come out and tell what, it, you know, I mean, what were they really doing that night? I mean, and from, they, and from your perspective, really go ahead, I'm sorry. I mean, were they really trying to send us help, or were they just kind of waiting for it to hopefully just blow over and nothing else would happen? And we see uh, former Secretary of State Clinton there taking her seat the last time she testified. And of course, everybody remembers she had that uh, heated moment there with members on the dais saying, what difference does it make? And, you know, as we again try to get to the bottom of all of this here, um, you know, you look ahead, of course, we cannot forget that there were lives lost in all of this. And from what you're hearing from uh, some of your former colleagues or maybe folks who are still working in security, are these diplomatic missions, the embassies, any safer than they were prior to Benghazi right now? I would hope so. Um, a lot of the guys, you know, they, we don't really talk too, too much about that kind of security stuff, especially back state, stateside. But um, I went, I did two trips afterwards, and at that point in time, nothing had changed. That's disheartening. That That's disheartening to hear, you know, and, and again here with former Secretary of State Clinton, her, of course, political future could be in the balance here, but we don't want to lose sight of the bigger picture here. Um, and again, it's just such a difficult moment. We've also heard from other members who were there on that night talking about what went down. But give us your take on what you remember from that night and, you know, what kind of calls were made to the State Department and what you really needed and what could maybe have prevented the outcome here. Well, the initial outcome of the Sean Smith and Ambassador Stevens, I mean, there was nothing the U.S. at the time of it, of it happening could have did, but they could have, beforehand, they could have added more security that the State Department requested. And uh, for the final outcome with the mortar attacks, I believe if they would have sent us some sort of air support, it would have made a huge difference on the mortar team that, that killed uh, Bob and Rowan. John, I want to ask you, blame game aside, um, a lot of people, um, you know, are, are looking at this, trying to get to the bottom of this to learn from the past in order to aid the future um, with future things such as this. Uh, we hope not happening, but if they do, um, I would like to know what drives your want to get future things such as this. Uh, we hope not happening, but if they do, um, I would they listen to us. I mean, if we advise something on security, they listen to us. The State Department, they didn't even bother to listen to them. They actually took stuff away from them. And that's the biggest thing that we would like for it to come and listen to us. The State Department, they didn't even bother to listen to them. They actually took stuff away from them, a chance to come home. And just like with the other ARBs that I've been listening to, have yet to implement those changes and 
I don't know. It's just say I hope that this committee can force them to actually finally do something. So for you, safety is the priority here, future safety. And listening to the guys that are actually on the ground and not pencil pushers back in D.C. Right. Yeah, I, I have to agree with you, John. It was somewhat frustrating to hear the testimony yesterday saying that they're doing the best they can, but they have not been able to implement everything that they've wanted to. I also wanted to get your take. We talked about, uh, you know, kind of the lack of rancor in the meeting yesterday. We're going to play a soundbite now from the chairman of the committee, uh, Trey Gowdy, and I want to get your response on the other side. Let's take a listen. So to those who believe it is time to move on, uh, to those who believe that there is nothing left to discover, that all the questions have been asked and answered and that we've learned all the lessons that there are to be learned, we have heard all of that before. And it was wrong then. Well, there we have uh, Congressman Trey Gowdy, the chairman of the committee, talking about there have, of course, been calls from some, maybe more on the left than on the right, obviously, uh, that we've learned everything. There's nothing new to see here. There's, uh, don't look under this rock. There's maybe we don't want to know all er, everything here. Do you think we're going to get any more answers than we've already seen, or do you think this is going to end in more disappointment, more uh, subterfuge, more confusion about what actually took place that night? Uh, there probably will be some more confusion that's going to happen, but it's hard to really say. I mean, if, especially if this uh, guy that came out that said that they were scrubbing, you know, the documents, how are they going to be able to find the documents that they said they were supposedly scrubbing? I mean, uh, I, it's hard to say. Now, it's just, it just comes down to the honesty of the individuals. Well, they are under oath, and that's important to remember here. Now, if you were up there testifying, uh, what would you like to tell the members of this committee? What would be the most important uh, uh, message you would like to send to them? To force the State Department to listen to the guys on the ground when they request for support, give it to them. Fair enough. And John, we want to thank you very much for your time and not only your time here on our program today, but also uh, for your service and everything you've done overseas. It's been a pleasure speaking with you, sir. You too. Thank you. All right, John Teagan, who was a member of the uh, security team that night, that fateful night uh, more than two years ago in Benghazi. We're going to turn our attention now to an American moment here. And of course, we're going to look back. This was a hobby that began in 1896 when two brothers experimented with the idea of flight. Seven years later, their dreams became reality. Now we focus in on the Wright brothers, the subject of this American moment. December 17, 1903 was a calm day at Kitty Hawk, North Carolina, when two brothers, Orville and Wilbur Wright, readied their aircraft for a demonstration that would change history forever. Their initial flight only lasted for 120 feet, but it was enough to eventually pave a pathway to the stars. Although the brothers were not the first to build and fly experimental aircraft, they were the first ones to invent the mechanical controls that made fixed-wing powered flight possible. But that proved both a blessing and a curse to an industry in its infancy. The Wright brothers' practice of demanding excessive fees for use of their patents and their litigious nature had an immediate and negative effect on the growth, safety, and improvement of the new industry of aviation. In 1917, Congress, recognizing air power would play a vital role in the upcoming war, passed legislation which, in effect, reduced the Wright brothers' royalty of $1,000 per plane to $200. The reduced fees sparked an explosion of growth and innovation in the new industry. Although initially outraged, the Wright family quickly realized the lower fees made it possible for more airplane manufacturers to enter the field. With more manufacturers came more planes, and with more planes came more royalties. Soon after, their royalties had exceeded $2 million in an age before income tax. Soon America was leading the air revolution. In 1927, young aviator Charles Lindbergh departed New York's Roosevelt Field for a 3,600-mile, 33-and-a-half-hour transatlantic journey to Le Berger Field in Paris, France. The dream of the Wright brothers had become a reality, and America had led the way thanks to Orville and Wilbur Wright. For Newsmax TV, I'm Bill Curtis, and this is an American Moment. 
Oh, Francesca, you've come a long way since uh, those way. early <laughs> days of flight. Now you look at what it's like to travel commercially throughout the country. Different world. Not quite as romantic as it was no. back in those days, no. certainly not. Safer, but, though. Safer. <laughs> Thanks for that. Well, we got much more ahead here on America's Former as well. We're going to continue to cover uh, the top stories today. We have another Newsmax Now update coming up for you. Rick Blackwell will be back with us in just a few moments. We'll also check back in with J.D. Hayworth, who's live in Washington, D.C. a little bit later. Thanks for staying with us and keep sticking around. More to come here on America's Forum right after this.